And I think, I think the work is completed and we now have a, a finished product that will probably be up in the next week or two on the website. It, it deals with a number of, of issues that confront these tribunals that, that uh, and I think the, the takeaway from all of this is that they do have problems with independence and impartiality. They have problems with their judges. The presidents of the courts, it seems to me, welcome the idea of having an additional document, additional to the existing codes of conduct for the judges that went into much more detail so that they can address these issues with their colleagues who are who tend to be an undisciplined lot, who, where there are problems in their, their conduct, where they don't have the, the traditions uh, even of a court like the International Court of Justice or the European Court of Human Rights, where there are decades and decades of practice and tradition. These courts are constantly renewing their membership and, and they need guidelines. It's not, it's not as straightforward as we might think. And it's particularly a challenge when we're trying to deal with international justice, as I said, in time of war. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, <clears throat> dear professor, for a great speech. I think that uh, really it's one of the most important questions. I mean, the question of criminal liability for the crime of aggression for the highest political establishment, uh, Russia. So it's really important and uh, we're looking forward for the development of this case. And as you mentioned, actually the question uh, of optimal composition of such tribunal, of course, uh, it's, uh, it's one of the, uh, of of the core issue and because why because the question of legitimacy of the final decision is at stake so uh, so it's very important so thank you thank you very much as well uh, and uh, we are going further the next speaker is um, uh, dr kasatin pilkov he is justice of the supreme court of ukraine um, from Grand Chamber, and uh, we are very grateful for Mr. Pilkov that he is, despite the hostilities and despite the war in Ukraine, he managed to come to Krakow and he is here present with us today. And um, so despite the uh, difficult connection, he managed to come. And um, prof um, Dr. Kostantin Pilkov uh, also, he is um, an associate professor at the Department of Civil, Commercial and International Private Law, the Kiev National University of Trade and Economy and economics in 2016 till 2022. Occasionally he gives lectures on the topics of evidence and sanctions as a guest lecturer of the National School of, School of Judge, uh, Judges of Ukraine. Prior to becoming Supreme Court Justice, uh, Pilkov had been practicing law as an attorney and arbitrator at several national and international arbitration institutions. And uh, as I mentioned, Dr. Pilkov is a justice of the Supreme Court in the Cassation Commercial court um, since 2017. In 2020, he was elected to the Grand Chamber, where the most important cases of commercial, civil, criminal, and administrative jurisdiction are decided upon in order to develop unified application of case law. So, uh, dear Justice will present uh, the topic uh, from the rule by law to the rule of law, the evolution of application of basic legal principles in the Supreme Court uh, jurisprudence. So, dear Justice, the floor is yours. Thank you. You may you, you may take seat here. I think it will be more even more convenient. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here in this very room upon the invitation of the Jagiellonian University, and I am very pleased to be talking to you. Uh, my dear colleagues who are present in this very room and uh, the broad audience that is connected to this uh, seminar via Zoom. Uh, we, after the very interesting presentation by Professor Shabas, we are getting back to the, uh, to the issues related to Ukraine. And my presentation, what I'm going to talk about to you today, is more optimistic apart if compared to what uh, Professor Stanislav Shevchuk covered in his very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, I will share I will share several slides of presentation so that mm -hmm, so that 
you can see some figures, some bullet points, and not only my face during those 20 minutes of my presentation. Now, I'm carefully assisted with this technical task. I probably I might continue that uh, I'm going to uh, talk about the evolution of application of general and area specific principles of law by the Supreme by the Ukrainian Supreme Court. Uh, I'm going to thank you, thank you very much. I hope that now the slides of my presentations of my presentation are clearly visible. No, I yes. no, something something is wrong. Probably I shouldn't. Oh, thank you. Thank you. During the darkest hours uh, of the early spring of 2022, a Ukrainian government reaffirmed the aspiration of uh, Ukrainian people to, to join the European community of the European states and reaffirmed uh, the Pledge of Allegiance of U Ukrainian people to the European values. We remain on this path towards the European future of Ukraine. And if there uh, is going to be a discussion after my presentation concerning the meaning of this direct application of constitutional principles, general principles of law and area specific principles, I move for the motion that this is a good thing for for Ukraine to move into that direction. Um, there was not always there was not always the, uh, the the same situation in the judiciary. In 2012, in one of the most comprehensive and probably the only comprehensive study on the application of general principles of law by the Ukrainian judiciary, Dr. Uvarova outlined several tendencies that were, um, that were domin dominant in the uh, judiciary. The most, the most important of them is that common courts, especially courts of first instance, uh, refer to the principles of law rather formally. They, are, they were used as a kind of declaration or even decoration for the text of, of, of uh, the mm, domestic judgments. Uh, without relying on those principles as a separate and sufficient ground for deciding upon the case. Uh, I believe that there were several factors or several waves that led to change of that situation. Before that, uh, by the way, I heard uh, the uh, uh, during one-to-one, um, -one, during the professional discussion that I had in this room before we started this seminar, I uh, understood that the situation in Poland was quite similar. So we are following uh, the, Pol the experience of Poland and probably I might expect for the insights, for the comments, for friendly remarks and criticism from uh, the professional community that we, we have here. So in Ukrainian legislation, in several procedural codes, and even in the civil code of Ukraine, we have probably the only one provision as to how the general principles are to be applied. 
and it's this provision that you can see on your screens. So the general principles of law have to be applied as an instrument of last resort. When there is no clear specific provision in the written law governing the uh, relations that are in dispute. So is the gap filling function is a sole practical feature of general principles of law. I move in favor of the motion that at least it is no more. And as I mentioned before, there were several, several factors that gradually led to the situation that changed. And I hope change in a positive way. In 2006, uh, after the Ukrainian parliament adopted a special law aimed at uh, enforcing the judgments of the European Court of Human Rights, um, with a specific provision of that law, the judgments of the Strasbourg Court formally became the source of law. That was very important for the Ukrainian legal system, which still remained on the pure legalistic and pure positivistic um, principles. So in that way, the ground was prepared for the conventional principles as they are viewed by the European Court of Human Rights to enter the realm of the source sources of law that are uh, to be actively applied by the Ukrainian courts. Next wave or next set of factors that led to change of the situation in Ukrainian judiciary uh, took place, I believe, in 2017, when uh, significant amendments were introduced to um, procedural codes Actually, the procedural codes were redrafted and uh, issued uh, new new versions. Uh, and those procedural co courts now contain the provisions according to which common courts have the power to disregard unconstitutional laws in a particular case. Before that, if a common court had doubts about the constitution constitutionality of a particular provision of a particular law, it had to refer that matter of law to the Supreme Court, which in its turn um, had to, or rather had the power to further address that problematic issue to the Constitutional Court of Ukraine. And if, the respective provision is recognized by the Constitutional Court of Ukraine as unconstitutional, it never applies. And certainly that uh, judgment has erga omnes, omnes effect. After 2017, the situation changed drama dramatically. The common courts, even the, com the court of first instance, now has the power to disregard the law that he believes is unconstitutional. And after that, refer that issue uh, of constitutionality to the Supreme Court, which in its turn uh, has the power to address it to the Constitutional Court. So that the opinion in a particular case, which has interpartum, interpartum effect, may have ergoomness effect. So for, for the whole society, not just for the particular case. Next part of the significant changes that took, part, uh, that took place in 2017 is the, as I call it, influx of uh, scholars and uh, representatives of <laughs> other branches of, uh, the, of uh, law practitioners into judiciary. Uh, there was a um, reloading process, a process of reloading of the Supreme Court and new blood flowed 
into the real, uh, into the judiciary. Many representatives, especially uh, that I that I value, many representatives of the uh, of scholars became uh, justices of the Supreme Court and brought new knowledge of new doctrines which uh, are not native for the Ukrainian um, for the Ukrainian case law for the Ukrainian legal system in general and with that knowledge of those doctrines in their brains they just cannot physically contain that knowledge to themselves and that like bursted into a new wave of ideas on how to apply new doctrines that are basically uh, founded on the principles that are actually embedded into Ukrainian into Ukrainian laws. I will uh, come to that later and illustrate that with with an example. And the third and probably last uh, important part of that wave that led to the change in application of principles is the creation of the new, of new structure of the Supreme Court. It, uh, now it contains of five um, main structural entities. Four of them are courts of cassation um, that um, according to the specific jurisdiction, there is a, a criminal court of cassation, administrative, civil, and commercial court of, court of cassations. They are governed, their procedure is governed by uh, they, they are separate uh, code uh, of procedures. But there is also grand chamber, which consists of the representatives from each court of cassation and uh, that deals with the most problematic issues which may might be referred by each of the courts of cassation to the grand chamber. And I believe that creation of that mechanism of grand chamber led to the transformation of, of the understanding and application of general principles. Since before that, every specialization, every jurisdiction was like in its own environment. And it was easy to say that some provisions, for example, of a specific procedural code that have mirroring or similar provisions in other codes, that they might be applied somehow differently and no other jurisdiction shall uh, get into this discussion, trying to discuss that those provisions actually should be applied and interpreted in a similar way. The Grand Chamber took different approach, completely different approach. It was not hiding behind the facade of a formal difference between codes. In uh, many cases, the Grand Chamber said that although procedural codes are formally separate laws and there might be difference between them, but if there is a similar approach, for example, between civil procedure and commercial procedure, they, are, they both are adversary. Uh, they uh, promote the um, uh, party autonomy basically they share the same approach. That means that if uh, some procedural issues are decided differently in different jurisdiction, there is something wrong with that. And the, that difference might be reconciliated uh, on the basis of general principles that led to the application of general principles of law mainly by the Grand Chamber. So as you may see in this uh, slide, these uh, waves, these at least three waves of changes gradually brought to the Ukrainian case law, the application of the conventional principles as they are interpreted by the 
European Court of Human Rights constitutional principles. Still on, on very rare occasions, but we are talking about the tendency, not, not the uh, results in uh, large numbers. So constitutional principles and general and area specific principles. Now, let me illustrate what I'm, what I'm talking about when I'm mentioning the application of, of principle. Uh, let, let us take an, uh, an example of the application of uh, doctrine of prohibition of inconsistent behavior or venire contrafactum proprium, as it is in Latin and as that Latin maxim is often used in Ukrainian judgments since 2000. 18. You will not, I, I believe you will not find in the uh, Unified State Registry of the uh, judgments any uh, judgment prior to 2018 where that doctrine is mentioned. And since that year, as you can see from this chart, there is gradual increase in mentioning of that doctrine, not uh, those figures do not mean that uh, it's, it's the number of the, of the uh, judgments that are based on that doctrine, but there is a great uh, part of ever increasing number. In 2022, due to the full scale invasion, I believe that tendency uh, slightly, slightly changed, slightly changed, but I believe that still you, you may see what the, the point that I'm trying to illustrate here. So this doctrine, which is not native for the Ukrainian uh, legal system, uh, which uh, was never, I mean, before 2018, applied by Ukrainian courts, uh, revived the principle of good faith and fair dealing. That very principle, I mean, principle of good faith was in Ukrainian civil court just from the beginning, as well as the principle of, for example, reasonability in civil relationships. But since it was too broad to be applied, it was rarely applied as a separate and sufficient ground for deciding upon the case. When the mechanism were, uh, mechanisms were created, when the ground was prepared by the application of the principles of the European uh, Convention uh, on Human Rights, and when the people, I mean, primarily the scholars, uh, entered the realm of ju judiciary, and brought the knowledge of those doctrines. As I, as I uh, told before, the situation changed. And the sleeping uh, principle of good faith um, obtained an application through the very specific doctrine of the of prohibition of inconsistent be behavior in uh, civil cases. There are many other examples where the specific doctrine, which was like a foreign for the for Ukrainian judges, but actually uh, was founded on the same principles that are embedded into Ukrainian legislation, is now applicable, directly applicable, even to the extent that the application of specific doctrines or principles may uh, displace the specific provisions of the written law, the so-called contra legem application, uh, especially uh, in those cases where something needs to be done by the court ex officio. For example, in uh, uh, land law disputes, we have uh, a rather outdated provision of the written law uh, regarding the remedy that is 
to be applied in case one of the parties of the land lease agreement, let's say, procrastinates with the a matter of prolongation of the lease of that lease agreement when the other party has expectations, legitimate expect expectations that that lease agreement uh, might be prolonged. And the law provides with the remedy that formally that, that is uh, constructed in the law as the challenging the unlawful delay with the signing of the additional agreement. However, in Ukrainian uh, case law, it is almost um, universally, yeah, I mean universally, by the uh, practitioners of, the, of, the, of law um, recognized that those decisions on um, obliging a person or a state authority to sign something or to decide upon uh, something are uh, mm, difficult, if not impossible to enforce, especially if the respondent is a collective entity. I mean, like a municipal authority or a state, a, a, a local council, council that consists of many peoples who should be brought to the responsibility in case of non-compliance with the final decision. The whole body, the majority, the ruling majority, the whip of the majority uh, who uh, did not perform uh, the tasks of assembling the council that led to the uh, opinion that those decisions are almost impossible to enforce. And the Ukrainian case law invented a remedy only based on the principle of the effectiveness of the justice, which was taken from the European Convention, which provides, which obliges the states to provide the effective remedy. However, the Convention obliged the states to provide effective remedy against the violation of the conventional rights. But Ukrainian judiciary interpreted that provision of the Convention broadly that the whole uh, administration of justice uh, has to result in an enforceable decision. And it's ex officio duty of the court, of the judge, to provide with the effective remedy. And thus, the case law and the application of the principle of the effectiveness of the justice, like overruled, uh, replaced the clear provision of the land law. Probably uh, last, uh, uh, in 2022, we had a fourth wave of uh, these changes in application of uh, general principles. Uh, the uh, Grand Chamber had an energy sector case uh, which was decided in a way that the Supreme Court uh, promoted the direct application of uh, some principles of the European Union law, in spite of the fact that um, it is the legislator who is expected to have on its shoulders the main burden of the approximation of the Ukrainian domestic law with, uh, with the European Union law. But the Ukrainian judiciary, having the understanding that our process of joining the European Union requires preparation, requires readiness, not just legislator from the beginning and then after there, there are disputes, there will be the turn of the Ukrainian judiciary. Ukrainian judiciary also took part in this process of preparation. And the, uh, and the Ukrainian legal system becoming ready for the joining to the European Union and uh, issued an opinion according to which in 
specific sectors, um, the Ukrainian law, uh, the, the principles of the European Union law have to be applied in the same way as the, the principles that are in, embedded in the uh, Strasbourg court judgments. So I believe that this is a fourth wave um, that led to application of the European Union principles of law. Now to the interesting part, after which I expect the lively debate in this audience and uh, among participants that are participating this seminar via Zoom. Uh, I found a survey conducted last year and according to the results of this survey, which was related to the direct application of the general principles of law, the majority of the European countries, at least those that participated in that survey and provided country reports, uh, apply the general principles only in case there are clear gaps in the written law. And Ukraine, which as I moved uh, in favor of the motion that the application of principles is a good thing, is becoming a member of a rather tiny club, rather tiny community of countries that apply the principles directly. Among them France, Netherlands, Greece, Bulgaria, Hungary, Latvia and Luxembourg. So uh, I kindly ask the members of the audience of today's seminars seminar to find your country in, in that list and uh, probably comment, uh, reflect on that and share your views on whether the situation is really as it is, as it was presented in this survey. On a separate note, and rather to and to um, clarify my views on the application of principles, I would refer to the uh, book of um, Tokyo University professor Dr. Kono, Efficiency in Private International Law where he distinguished between uh, rule and standards. The main approach of the legislator to regulate the social relationships with the clear and specific rules for every situation or uh, rather stick with the standard approach, approach where the standards are the main instrument. Uh, for example, the rule might be very specific with establishing uh, specific terms, uh, deadlines for 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 some some uh, deeds and um, transactions. Whereas standards refer to, for example, standard of reasonability, standard of fairness. It relies on flexibility in application of the law. It relies on the common understanding of common concepts. That understanding has to be common um, among all members of the society and the judiciary. So I believe, and by the way, the reasonability, the fair deal are recognized in Ukrainian, for example, civil law as principle, principles of the civil law and principles of the civil relationships. Is it the same with your jurisdictions? Because if it is so, then I believe we have to distinction, uh, uh, distinguish those standards from the realm of other principles. Because uh, there is a significant difference, significant uh, difference uh, between the principle of reasonability and, for example, principle of continuation of public service, which is a supra legislative, has supra legislative importance in France, for example. Uh, there is no 
room for assessment. There is no uh, line where we can um, assess the continuation of public service, whereas there is one in case of reasonability. That behavior is more reasonable, less reasonable. Where is it on the spectrum? So uh, this is where I, I'm going to wrap up my presentation, where I'm going to end with, um, with my speech. I, I I'm, will be happy if you have any insights, any criticism or comments, any uh, thoughts you might share as to whether I'm too optimistic in my assessment of the progress that Ukrainian judiciary is making in its movement from purely logistic, from purely positivistic approaches in application of the law, where some unpredictable, not unpredictable, but paradoxical outcome, and not always fair, uh, might take place towards the application of standards, new doctrines, and principles in general that might lead to more flexibility, but less legal certainty for which the uh, national judiciary might be criticized. Because one of the main tasks, one of the main uh, obligations that the Ukrainian Supreme Court was uh, entrusted with was to, uh, to secure legal certainty, the predictability of the case law. And if we are moving simultaneously in both those directions, if we are trying to secure the legal certainty, the absolute predictability of court judgments, it might be hard to apply the approach of using standards as the main uh, legal reason, as the main legal ground for deciding upon, upon the cases. And probably it is for me and for my fellow colleagues in the judiciary, as well as for legal scholars in Ukraine to explain that it is not quite possible to move simultaneously in those two directions. Either we choose the standards, more flexibility, and predictably more legal certainty, or we choose the rule approach where we have that legal certainty, but the result might, might be uh, dura lex sed lex, which is which was, was, was made, mentioned by Kristina Trichlip the day I uh, came to Krakow, and which might be used as a facade for justifying the decisions that are not quite in compliance with the general understanding of what is reasonable, what is fair. Uh, by this, I'm going to stop my monologue. Thank you all for your attention uh, and express my gratitude to the host of this seminar and express my uh, sincere interest in the debate, in your questions, reflections, and comments upon um, all uh, uh, this topic and every other topic that is to, to be presented today during this seminar. Thank you, thank you very much. I would, thank you. Uh, do you hear me? <clears throat> yes, we can hear uh, you. Thank you, thank you, because I can't hear the screen, but uh, it's okay. So uh, uh, thank you, dear Justice, for your very, uh, very interesting presentation. You touched upon 
many questions, very interesting, especially for me as a series of law concerning the correlation of uh, the letter, black letter of law and the spirit of law. So I think that it's really important, especially when we are talking about the correlation of principles and legal norms and the possibility to deliver just uh, judgments, <clears throat> uh, as you mentioned. Um, uh, so, um, contra legem, yeah, uh, as uh, Alexi, Robert Alexi mentioned in his uh, famous book. So um, I think that we will have time for discussion and we will discuss uh, in, uh, in details these questions. And I'm very happy to, <clears throat> to give uh, the floor to Dr. Alice Donald from Middlesex University. Uh, Dr. Alice Donald is an associate professor in the School of Law at Middlesex University. Um, Alice, uh, her research interests uh, include the relationship between human rights and uh, democratic governance and matters related to human rights implementation, particularly in the UK and Europe. Uh, she is co-editor with Joel Grohan of the Rutledge Handbook of Law and the COVID-19 Pandemic uh, and many other books also published in Oxford University uh, Press. So, um, um, uh, Dr. Alice Donald will present the topic um, defending the rule of law in the Council of Europe, the road from uh, Reykjavik. So, uh, dear Alice, uh, you're very welcome. Thank you so much. Could I share my uh, screen, Christina? Um, uh, yeah, it yeah, it's possible, yeah. Ah, yeah, okay, great. There we go. I've just uh, prepared a few uh, slides um, to uh help me present yes on the rule of law in the council of europe um and i've used as my focus the recent summit held in may in reykjavik um only the fourth summit in the history of the council of europe um and i think it gives us a good sort of point of reflection to look at the capacity perhaps also the willingness of the council of europe institutions to respond to multiplying threats uh, to the rule of law so I've included here um, quite a colourful quote from uh, Andrew Ford writing about the uh, summit, uh, capturing, I think, very well, as he says, the problems of democratic and indeed rule of law backsliding, bad faith, non-execution of judgments, and even, of course, deliberate political attacks on the convention system, uh, not least from the UK, I should add, um, as well as what seems to have become a rather systematic um, uh, sense in which the Council of Europe is not properly resourced to do all the things that it needs to do, and I can give you some specifics on that later. And the, the point Andrew is making, I think, is well made, which is, that, of course, this was the first summit for nearly 20 years. There had been uh, three earlier summits between uh, 1993 and 2005, which were very consequential, which led to the creation of the full-time European Court of Human Rights, the Office of the Commissioner of Human Rights, and a plethora of other you know, standards and institutions. And there had been some moves indeed um, as far back as 2017 to convene a fourth summit, but it took uh, Russia's barbarous actions in Ukraine to provide the kind of political momentum uh, for that to happen. There simply wasn't a kind of critical mass of support for it until the last uh, year or 18 months. So the Council of Europe convened what was called a high level reflection group, which set out quite an ambitious agenda and indeed recommended the holding of the fourth summit, which the Icelandic uh, Secretariat of the Council of Europe at the time uh, embraced, I think, with, with great commitment and enthusiasm uh, to uh, hold uh, the, the summit that took place in Reykjavik in May. So the broad, very broad agenda for the summit, of course, top of the list was ensuring, uh, or at least beginning the process of ensuring accountability for Russia's crimes in Ukraine, but also much more broadly than that, um, to sort of revive and, uh, you know, for, for states almost to recommit to the effectiveness of the convention as a system for protecting human rights. And in particular, and I'll return to this in the second part of my presentation, the implementation of judgments of the court, as well as reiterating the principles of democracy and also broadening the agenda even further to, and this was a particular commitment, I think, of the Icelandic Secretariat 
to advance the agenda of human rights in the environment and take possibly a step towards a freestanding right to a healthy and sustainable environment, um, which has been, for example, promoted by the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. So was the summit a success? Um, well, there were 80% of heads of state and government attended um, to be in Strasbourg the week after the summit. And I asked various people, I had the chance to ask a few of the judges of the court, people from the Office of the Commissioner for Human Rights, what they thought about it. And they did all say that they felt the level of participation alone was a kind of diplomatic achievement on the, on the part of the uh, Icelandic Secretariat. Um, by far the most concrete uh, outcome of the summit, uh, all of which is summarized in this Reykjavik declaration, emphasizing the principle of the sort of unity around the values, was uh, the register of damage for Ukraine, which had been heavily trailed. It was, it was no surprise that it came out. So this is, of course, a transitional step towards a comprehensive international mechanism uh, with a compensation fund and a compensation commission, uh, such as has been uh, advocated by uh, UN General Assembly resolution. So the, the part that the, that the Council of Europe has, has done under its own auspices then is this register of damage. Um, what do we know about it so far? Well, 37 uh, of the now 46 member states have joined it, uh, three of them with a sort of associate status. Um, but it is an enlarged agreement, so it does also include its main fund of the European Union, uh, Canada, Japan, Mexico, the US. As you may know, it's been opposed by six states, one might call them the usual suspects here, who have uh, not signed up to the Register of Damage. Uh, it will be based in The Hague with a satellite office in Ukraine initially for three years. And of course, one of its first jobs will be to uh, assess and decide the admissibility criteria. So it's anticipated that these will be fairly broad, recording evidence and to start to register claims for damage, loss or injury caused by the Russian aggression um, for um, a wide range of uh, forms of dam damage, loss and injury, including not only uh, death, uh, an injury, but also sexual violence, uh, property claims, and claims by uh, government also in relation to infrastructure and environmental damage. One of the points of note, I think, is that the, uh, the agreement, this enlarged agreement, sets down the temporal jurisdiction of the register as being from February 2022 and not uh, earlier, uh, dating back to 2014, when of course Russia began the annexation of Crimea. So that, that decision appears to have been made through the enlarged agreement itself, but much else uh, remains to be decided by uh, the uh, institution as it begins its work. Um, one of the questions I think is uh, victim participation. So this so far has been a kind of perhaps of necessity, a sort of top-down initiative. So I think from this point on the issue of victim participation in uh, deciding indeed the admissibility criteria will be very important. Um, interestingly, it's also suggested that the, um, this initiative uh, will also be a means of compensating claimants who've secured, secured judgments at the European Court of Human Rights and also, for example, in investment tribunals. So this could be an interesting kind of concrete route to accountability um, to uh, make up, as it were, for non-participation of Russia uh, in, the, uh, in, in relation to the convention system at this point. Huge questions, of course, remain about where the funding will come from, whether Russian assets should be seized or how they should be uh, seized in order to, to fund this. Um, I won't uh, mention this in any detail because Professor Chavis has already touched upon this, the idea of in the future a special tribunal for the crime of aggression, I think it was always clear that this wouldn't be held under Council of Europe auspices, but the Reykjavik Declaration did pledge the Council of Europe's technical support for the establishment um, of such a tribunal, whatever form this may, may take. Now, um, in relation to other questions on the summit's very broad um, agenda, I thought that I would just take one of them to try and provide a bit of 
uh, more, more flesh on the bones, so to speak. So I've picked the uh, issue of the implementation or non-implementation, uh, this, this chronic problem really of non-implementation of judgments of the court to identify, first of all, well, what is the scale of this problem? What do the declaration have to say about it? And then I will finish very briefly by just proposing some much more concrete solutions than were uh, recommended in the declaration, which indeed it is to be hoped that the now Latvian presidency of the Council of Europe will take forward. I think the intention always was that the Reykjavik declaration perhaps in, in the nature of these things is a, is a, a you know, a set of rather lofty uh, commitments, the, the register of damage being really the only tangible thing that came out of it. Um, it is perhaps deliberately vague in, in, in some ways, but there remains the door open, I think, to uh, implementing some much more concrete reforms. So to take this issue of the uh, problem in relation to the implementation of, of the judgments of the court, and the scale of the problem. How can we, how can we, you know, conceive of the scale of this problem? Well, one of the uh, perhaps the main barometer of this problem is the number of so-called leading judgments of the court. That is, judgments that reveal new systemic structural problems which have not yet been implemented. And there are thirteen hundred of those. Um, another way of expressing that is that uh, almost half of leading judgments issued in the last 10 years have not, not yet been implemented, and the average time taken for implementation is uh, more than six years. Um, that matters not just in terms of the sort of human cost of, of justice being delayed in some cases, but also very much in relation to the rule of law. So, to take just one instance, uh, Bakker, the case of Bakker versus Hungary, which involved the illegitimate removal of the president of the Supreme Court for uh, uh, criticizing uh, state attacks on judicial independence. This case was lodged in 2012, but the judgment was given in 2016. And of course, in those intervening years, attacks on judicial independence and impartiality have multiplied become entrenched in many ways. And of course, nothing has really happened since the judgment was issued. So a, a, a good example of why this rather kind of sclerotic system with, with you know, it, gaps of many years of, of, of implementation and indeed of judgments being issued by the court is, is problematic. So we have this sort of vicious circle whereby the backlog of cases coming to the court um, a huge percentage of which, as you can see, are these so-called repetitive cases clogging up the system with applications stemming from the same root cause. Um, half of the judgments that became final in 2021, for example, had been uh, awaiting judgment of the court for more than five years. Uh, Bakker was a little bit less than that, but still the consequences, of course, were, were uh, egregious. So that's just some facts and figures to illustrate this, this, this problem, <clears throat> both of the backlog before the court itself, and then of course also the backlog <coughs> before the Committee of Ministers in relation to non-implemented judgments. The reasons for that are, I think we're starting to understand much better. Sometimes they are to do with lack of capacity and poor government sort of implementation mechanisms, the lack of coordination of the implementation effort. And of course, we also have these much more noticeable issues of high level political resistance, stark illustrations of which are the continued detention, uh, both of Alexander Navalny in Russia and Osman Kavala in uh, Turkey. Um, and there are currently right now uh, more than 75,000 applications pending before the court. Now, many of those will be in the end found to be based upon well-established case law and will be able to be dealt with by the more streamlined procedures that the single judge and three judge formations that the court has formed to deal with this uh, problem of backlog. Um, but not all, of course, will fall into that category. And we can compare this figure of 75,000 pending applications before the court right now to the number of judgments that the court has ever issued, which is something like 26,000. So that gives you an order of the problem that the, the pending applications right now are almost three times as high as the number of judgments that the court has ever issued. 
So that, that's just to give you um, some sense of the, this kind of nature and the scale of the problem. Uh, we see here also the relatively few uh, states, Turkey, Russia, Ukraine itself, Romania, and so on, that account for the, uh, this is this is current, the pending applications. Um, at the moment, you can see that a relatively few states are a cause of the, uh, you know, well over half of the, of the problem. So what does the declaration say on this particular issue? Uh, well, as I said, in a sense, what we have is the possibly deliberately vague uh, um, language here, indicative rather than prescriptive, a sense of what is sought to be achieved rather than how to achieve it. Uh, so the Council of Europe recommitting itself to resolving these kind of systemic structural problems that the leading cases that I refer to improving the effectiveness of the mechanism and ensuring that the committee of ministers body that's responsible kind of day to day for the tracking of what states do or don't do after judgments are issued is properly resourced, scaling up cooperation programs, etc. And also uh, talking about clear, predictable, gradual steps in the event of non-execution or persistent refusal to execute or implement judgments of the court in an appropriate and flexible way. So that's the language of the declaration um, itself. And uh, you can see that it's rather short on any specifics. So what I've done here, uh, finally, is to gather together some of the more concrete proposals which have emerged before and during the um, summit, uh, very many of them coming from academics and also from uh, non-government uh, organizations. So one is to uh, seize the opportunity to make the so-called infringement proceeding uh, option more effective, to use it more often, more quickly, and more resolutely. Um, so you may know that this proceeding provided for under Article 46 of the Convention, whereby the Committee of Ministers, if it can achieve a two-thirds majority, can refer a judgment back to the court if it considers that a state is refusing to implement a judgment. But this has, I think, wrongly in my view, always been seen as a kind of nuclear option, you know, almost unthinkable in its implications, and has only been used twice, uh, both times in relation to the illegit illegitimate de uh, political detentions. Uh, in one instance, uh, Ilgar Mamadov was eventually released from detention in um, Azerbaijan, but as I mentioned, Osman Kangala remains uh, languishing in prison despite a judgment ordering his release back in 2017 and now a 2022 infringement procedure judgment, but Turkey has still uh, not released Kerala. These, of course, were also individual cases. Um, and so one suggestion is that states, the Committee of Ministers, governments essentially should be more willing to use this proceeding for the systemic and structural problems, not only in individual cases, and with the use of uh, sanctions. So specifically here, one option could be the suspension of states' participation rights in Council of Europe institutions as a kind of internal sanction, if you like, for non-implementation of judgments, which has really never been conceived of before. There effectively have been no sanctions for non-compliance. Another idea, relatedly, is to revive an idea which was mooted by the Parliamentary Assembly quite some years ago, which is for uh, financial sanctions on states for non-compliance with judgments of the court. Um, that was proposed, essentially squashed by governments, uh, I think well over 10 years ago. So this is a, an idea which could be put back on the table. Other, <clears throat> other proposals are for a significant increase in technical cooperation programs. That's really to address, if you like, not the cases of refusal to implement, but where there are uh, gaps in terms of state's capacity or technical know-how to implement particularly judgments that require kind of complex and protracted general measures. Also proposals to change the way in which the committee ministers operates, which as you may know, is rather behind closed doors. This is a kind of peer-to-peer -peer mechanism which is rather opaque, therefore, in relation to the possibility of, of you know, public hearings, for example. So one proposal is to have more, more frequent and more transparent, at least to some extent, meetings of the Committee of Ministers with the option, for example, of summoning 
diplomatic representatives or ministers even from the states concerned. Um, increased funding for the committed ministers to do this work is also important. Um, a piece of uh, research I did last year uh, revealed that I think that each of the, there's about 25 lawyers working in this department, in the committed ministers that has this vital task of doing this day-to-day -day tracking of what states are doing. <clears throat> and each of those individual lawyers has about 250 non-implemented judgments on their desk, including 50 le uh, leading cases, which of course can be extremely complex. So really this whole thing, you know, should be scaled up. And of course that would require more resources. The same is true, by the way, and, and the president of the European Court, Shifra O'Leary, made this very clear at the summit of the need to also increase funding for the court. Um, greater civil society engagement. This has been increasing quite a lot in recent years in terms, for example, of civil society organisations making so-called Rule 9 submissions to the Committee of Ministers, that is, putting evidence before the Committee of Ministers to complement and sometimes indeed to refute evidence that's been presented by states as to what they've done in response to judgments. And then finally, uh, various means of upping, you know, ramping up pressure and increasing coordination between the different arms of the Council of Europe. So one very concrete suggestion uh, would be of, of at least symbolic value is for the senior officials of all the Council of Europe bodies to insist upon visiting Osman Kavala in prison to, to increase pressure on Turkey. So that is just a few that by no means the only uh, specific um, proposals that have been made that could put some flesh on the bones, if you like, of those rather uh, vague um, commitments issued by uh, the Committee of Ministers or by, by heads of state and government, I should say, at the end of the summit. And I'll leave you then with just a, a, a quote uh, from the court itself. This was issued, uh, its memorandum to the heads of state of government before they uh, met in Reykjavik, uh, which I think speaks for itself again about the urgency of the of the conflict uh, in Ukraine and, and the impact the seismic impact really that has on the whole continent and the, and the whole of uh, the, the institution of the Council of Europe um, and the the need indeed to you know uh, respond much more resolutely than the Council of Europe has been able to do so far to these multiplying uh, threats to the rule of law. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very, very much for your attention. And thank you again, Christina and colleagues for such a, a kind invitation to attend today. Thank you very much, dear Alice, for a great uh, presentation and involvement. Uh, and uh, as you mentioned, uh, the role of the Council of Europe in the process, uh, in this process of elaboration of effective mechanism for compensation for damages is also important. And um, especially in comparison with the other institutions in U European and international, we could say that uh, the Council of U uh, Europe uh, is quite a leading. Play leading a leading role in this um, process, but as you mentioned, oh, still we have problems. First of all, it's uh, funding and uh, simply human resources. So we need uh, still we need fine uh, funding for um, collecting evidence for everything and human resources. And we have these crises even in Ukraine nowadays. Um, but still, we have we have uh, we have the challenge for the international private law to elaborate the effective mechanism to transfer the frozen assets, Russian assets of private person. And still, we need to elaborate this uh, this mechanism, and it raises um, it raises some uh, some problems because now um, these assets uh, they are just frozen. Uh, but uh, we, uh, Ukraine as a state, unfortunately, we uh, do not uh, receive these uh, funds. Um, okay, so and the last but not least uh, speaker for our today's for workshop, it's Professor Angela Di Gregorio from the uh, University of uh, Milan. Um, professor um, Angela de Gregorio is a full professor of comparative public law at the University of Milano. Her research interests include transition of uh, democracy, democratic deterioration, constitutional justice, transitional justice, and academic um, mm, mm, freedom. She is a member of many Italian and international lawyers' associations. 
uh, and also editor in chief of the journal Novi Autoritarism e Democrazia, uh, uh, is uh, if <laughs> am I right in Italian? Uh, anyway, uh, Professor Angela de Gregorio also has been an expert of the European uh, Parliament, uh, in particular um, uh, Russian speaking minorities in the Baltic Sea. So, uh, dear Angela, will, um, dear Professor, will present uh, the topic uh, constitutional building in the former Soviet republics, competing models, and recent uh, evolutions. So, uh, dear um, Angela, the floor is uh, yours. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm very honored to be here to be invited among this very uh, well known specialist. And uh, I hope my connection uh, with, will last until the end of my presentation because I don't have a good connection at home. But uh, thank you very much. Um, in my presentation, um, I, I will, uh, this, these are the main points. The slides are a few. So. <laughs> um, I will try to give a very general overview of the constitutional developments in the former uh, Soviet Republic since the collapse of the USSR. Uh, considering that uh, there are so many countries involved and the limited time at disposal, I will only summarize the main developments in the area in the last uh, 32 years, uh, proposing a classification of the different subdivisions or sub-models of constitutionalism. Uh, I will apply the method of comparative law, uh, which normally includes the consideration of the political and cultural context of the countries examined. And uh, in order to better understand the constitutional developments in the area, I will also briefly remind the constitutional path of the Central Eastern Europe at large, meaning the former socialist countries. Um, the former um, USSR countries uh, have been submitted to different constitutional and cultural influences since the, since the conquest or reconquest of statehood, uh, being today at different levels of both constitutionalization and democratization. In the last 32 years, the balance of these different influences has experienced significant variations, resulting in the corroboration. Uh, I will go <laughs> through in the corroboration of authoritarian political systems in most of the former USSR republics, namely uh, Russia, Belarus, Azerbaijan, and the five uh, Central Asian republics, um, of a democratic and pro-European perspective in the three Baltic states, uh, while a struggle is still ongoing in some Western and Caucasic republics, such as Georgia, Armenia, uh, Ukraine, and Moldova, in order to consolidate their uh, Euro-Atlantic constitutional and political choice. Um, although the political and constitutional developments of the wider area of Central Eastern Europe um, and the former Soviet space have many common features, for example, the subjection to multinational empires in history, uh, then to the communist domination, uh, followed in different times and forms by paths of democratization or neo-autocratization, uh, constitutional research at the international level on the former Soviet states, except of, from the Baltic states, is less developed. In fact, the constitutional evolution of the current members of the European Union, as well as of the Western Balkan candidates, has been the subject of very in-depth studies in the Italian, maybe, or international legal doctrine, but in the face of the democratic transition and in that of the illiberal degeneration that has affected some of these countries. Um, a really, very, really brief reminder of the constitutional history, uh, the history of the constitutionalism in the big area of Central Eastern Europe, uh, demonstrate that the roots of the actual differentiations go back to as far as the imperial period. It should be remembered that among the empires that dominated this vast geographical area for centuries, the most restrictive from a political point of view 
included the dynamics of territorial and national autonomy was the Tsarist one, and the most pluralistic was the Austro-Hungarian one, especially in the Austrian part. Uh, within the empires, constitutional ideas circulated or were in some cases even uh, tested. Um, without dwelling on the ancient experiences within the kingdoms of Poland and Lithuania, uh, where in the Middle Ages, uh, some developments of English constitutionalism were even anticipated, such as the Bill of Rights of the noble type, the practices of liberal constitutionalism applied in the Habsburg Empire are well known, where proto-federal characteristics can be found together with the exercise of parliamentarianism representation for the component nations. Subsequently, in the rich constitutional cycle following the First World War, some constitutions adopted in the states which became independent following the collapse or war defeat of the empires proved to be in the very progressive, in particular those of Czechoslovakia and the Baltic states, uh, but also for a while the 1922 Polish constitution. Uh, despite being today in the international literature little known or little considered due to their short time applications. At the end of the communist regime, starting from the end of the 1980s, a new wave of constitutional reforms began, again looking at Western models, but also at their own traditions. The domestic processes of constitutionalization were then combined with the influence of the democratic conditionality of the Council of Europe and of the European communities. The countries that has just emerged from the collapse of communism were uh, then considered as a land devoid of traditions, ready for the implementation of the solutions offered by liberal democratic constitutionalism. So uh, not considering their previous uh, past traditions. But in the process of adopting new constitutions in the 1990s, the complex dialectic of constitutional patterns available to the countries of Central Eastern Europe and the former USSR began to emerge. In particular, uh, the collapse of the socialist regimes characterized by uh, homogeneous ideological and institutional principles was followed by a differentiated dynamic in which both the cultural traditions and the geo geopolitical situation played within the common formal acceptance um, of democratic standards. Um, focusing more uh, accurately uh, on the former Soviet space, uh, despite a common historical framework that goes from the Tsarist empire to the collapse of USSR, the former Soviet area is very differentiated because it includes territories that were conquered at different times in different geographical areas, which had different political affiliations in history, languages and cultures, religions, social and economic structures are also very differentiated. Uh, at the time of the disintegration of the USSR, uh, with the well-known exception of the Baltic countries, in the other countries, an, initial, uh, an initially similar path uh, has been followed. The common will to distance from the previous political system, the attention to the formulas of Western constitutionalism in the first parts of the constitution, an evident mixture of old and new in the first constitutional developments, which lasted until the beginning of the 2000s, where uh, there were the first profound constitutional amendments also following the emergence of the so-called colored revolutions. Over time, the coexistence and the mix, mixing of these elements has changed and each country has begun to take more independent parts. In each of the constitution of this area, uh, sorry, I will maintain this one. In each of the constitutions, the distance from the previous regime was underlined, emphasizing the centrality of the individual and the defense of his rights and the refusal of the leading role of a political party. These are affirmations that were quickly denied in the political practice. Uh, furthermore, from the beginning, the sections on fundamental rights and principles were refuted 
by the sections regarding the system of government or form of government and the territorial organization, which immediately demonstrated a more centralized and distant from the characteristic of constitutionalism approach. Um, some systems of government initially characterized by a certain balance between powers over time has seen the axis shift more and more towards the centralization of powers in the hands of the new elected head of states, heads of state. The president who represents national unity was given incisive powers from the outset and then increased with subsequent reforms or with the well-known doctrine of the implied powers. Exceptions to this are countries such as Ukraine, of, of course, whose political and constitutional history is among the most tormented of the former Soviet republics, but also Moldova, Armenia, Georgia, and Kyrgyzstan, uh, which have had a fluctuating uh, trend. The mechanism of the division of powers, decentralization, political pluralism, in short, the liberal content of the, constitution, the, the constitutions collided with the legacies of the Tsarist and Soviet past, to which uh, one can add, and this is another very relevant element of the context, uh, the needs of the moment, to the point that even some Western advisors have considered Western models unsuitable for some of these countries, especially in terms of the division of powers. In fact, in some of these republics, I will then um, more precisely uh, detail which ones, the conception of the strong state has remained as a distinctive feature of the local political culture, ending in most cases with its re-emergence either immediately or uh, gradually. Um, the constitutional stages experienced by the republics of the former USSR uh, since the conquest of statehood are many, but I, uh, we can um, divide in the main three um, macro stages three macro stages can be identified. The first one concerns the period of adoption of the first constitutional text, uh, which replaced the previous uh, reform, the late Soviet text, and this period com comes from 1992 to 1996. In the second phase between 2000 and 2015, uh, some countries adopted democratic or liberalizing constitutional revisions following the so-called uh, uh, colored or uh, electoral rev revolutions, uh, while other adopted instead constitutional amendments under the banner of uh, so-called authoritarian modernization aimed at, further at a further concentration of powers in the hands of the national leader to stem the danger of protests. In a third phase from 2016 to uh, today, up to today, there were further constitutional revisions in a more authoritarian direction in some countries. Uh, for example, the Azerbaijani constitutional uh, revision of 2016, the Russian uh, reform of 2020, the Belarusian one, 2022, the new constitution of Kyrgyzstan in 2021, um, amendments approved by referendum in Kazakhstan in 2022, and also the last constitutional reform in Uzbekistan this year, uh, that notwithstanding a wider focus on the fundamental rights, further extended the presidential term. But this phase also includes the amendments of the Ukrainian constitution 2019, which opens the system up to Euro-Atlantic integration. And also in this, this third phase, uh, we can include some constitutional adjustments resulting from the interpretation of the constitutional courts, for example, in Moldova 2016, or a from a further political approaching to Western standards as occurred in Armenia after the Velvet Revolution 2018, which placed the end of Sarkisan rule, and Georgia with 2017 amendments moving from direct election of the president to the election by a special constituency and to a further redu reduction of his powers, of her power. Um, in general, 
in general, uh, the democratization in some of the former Soviet republics has led to an effective reduction in the role of the head of state, substantially depriving him or her of the function of dominus of the formation and revocation uh, of the government or of the parliament dissolution, although uh, they kept important levels of power. Um, this can certainly be said to have occurred uh, only in a few cases, Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova, Armenia. On the contrary, in the case of Kyrgyzstan, after the failure of two electoral revolutions in 2005 and 2010, the new constitution of 2021 uh, seems to have returned to um, an uh, I, I, I would say a Russian model of the governing uh, autocrat or governing president. Uh, the limitation of the powers of the president were occurred uh, um, have, has powered that greater division between the legislative and the executive powers, making operational a system of checks and balances that has fueled the political dialectic turnover of the elites and a greater responsibility of all political actors. Uh, analyzing uh, post-Soviet uh, constitutionalism in different phases, the existence of a distinct model of Eurasian constitutionalism appeared, where the element of centralized state constitutionalism clearly prevails over divided state constitutionalism. I use the classification of um, an Australian scholar, very known constitutional lawyer, uh, William Partlett. Um, this constitutional format, which involves, for example, the existence of systems of government based on the so-called crown presidentialism, this is another label uh, coined by uh, William Partlett, or to use the classifications of sugar and carry of parliamentarianism with president, seems to be uh, successful in about half of these republics, the same I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation. So the five or uh, four, uh, four uh, uh, Central Asian republics, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, uh, Belarus, and Russia. While in others, the combination of the two variants of constitutionalism seems to shift the organization of powers in recent years towards a more balanced uh, positions uh, in the system of government, closer to a semi-presidential uh, presidential or even parliamentary model uh, system of government. Um, the Eurasian model, uh, is built under the banner of the centralization of power for purposes of control, but also of development, and to ensure coexistence between different people, not only from a national and cultural point of view, but also from a religious point of view, in a sort of paternalistic system, uh, possible only thanks to the horizontal and vertical concentration of power. To define these constitutional partners that reminds more the imperial Tsarist uh, period than the Soviet one, especially with reference to the republics of Central, uh, Central Asia, some authors use the term also uh, pseudo-constitutionalism, the same term used by Max Weber to indicate the constitutional reforms adopted in the Tsarist empire in the early 20th century. We are therefore dealing with a different conception of constitution and of the state with respect to that of the liberal constitutionalism as the result of a previous historical inheritance that considers the concentration of powers in the hands of the leader of the nation to be the pursuit of goals vital to the survival of the state. Uh, in the last part of my presentation, I will say something about um, uh, the European path, uh, also from constitutional point of view, of Ukraine, Moldova, and Georgia. Uh, these are countries that, uh, thanks to the um, influence uh, from the Council of Europe and the conditionality of the association agreements uh, before the uh, apply before applying uh, for the entry into the Union, but since the um, uh, writing of the association agreements with the European Union within the framework of the Eastern Partnership, 
In the last years, these countries have undertaken constitutional reforms at a, 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 aimed at reducing the role of the head of state and at introduce a greater political and institutional pluralism. Um, these countries uh, that applied to join the Union uh, in March 2022 are placed at the crossroad of uh, cultural and historical complexity, which also becomes a constitutional complexity. Uh, the constitutional evolution of these countries in the post-Soviet period took place in the name of progress and setbacks, proceeding in a manner consistent with the internal political and cultural uh, dynamics, uh, especially the uh, identity, political and constitutional difficulties of Ukraine um, are in fact more accentuated than the, those of the other former Soviet republics, as evidenced by the fact that the constitution was adopted later in 1996, and with the system of government uh, later further remodeled according to the events of the Orange Revolution and the uh, Revolution of Dignity, which more than the others in the area restricts the role uh, of the president with respect to the government and parliament, even if inevitably the events of war increases, increase the role of the head of state from an operational and mediatic point of view, now there is a real uh, war constitutionally. So, considering the uh, on the one hand the constitutional um, the constitutional um, systems of the member countries of the European Union, which, however, include also a degenerate form of illiberal uh, or populist constitutionalism. And on the other hand, the authoritarian Eurasian model from which these countries have certainly completely distanced, the constitutional offer available for the two new candidates uh, for the third potential one, which is Georgia, will be affected not only by the previous experience of other former socialist satellites, states uh, now members of the union, but also by that of the Western Balkans, which came out of national conflicts of unusual cruelty. In, in, in the end of my presentation, I will, I will uh, also briefly comment the, the latest developments in European democratic conditionality. For example, considering the, re, the, the methods of selection of constitutional judges in Ukraine, which I'm currently studying for a, an article uh, that I have to write. Um, some reflection of the, this conditionality and uh, democratic processes can be made. In fact, the large number of requirements and the significant international influence on certain countries reveal a deep distrust in all the countries' institutions, not just the political ones. This profound distrust leads to the complication of procedures, the multiplication of rules, which often, with often or um, sometimes anti, un, unsatisfactory uh, results, which should lead to a rethinking of the way international consultancy is operated in certain contexts, uh, to avoid a complete paralysis of certain institutions, uh, for example, the guarantee constitutions, uh, institutions which would be a worse scenario, especially in a condition of work and constitutionalism. I will um, I will be happy to to discuss this with the distinguished colleagues, especially the constitutional or former constitutional court judge of Ukraine. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Alice, uh, you touched upon, uh, covered many interesting questions uh, um, uh, as well. And uh, of course, uh, I'm just thinking about the, uh, the Ukrainian um, experience um, because um, now we're talking about, of course, the European integration is important and we are trying to, uh, despite the hostilities, we are trying to continue the reformation of uh, constitutional court and uh, the process of adaptation of our legislation to acu communautaire. Um, and I'm thinking that uh, actually uh, recently, just a few days ago, the European Commission uh, issued the last uh, conclusion on the process of progress um, of European integration of Ukraine. And um, this conclusion is, is uh, quite um, 
successful, I would say, of course, we have to work further, but I'm just thinking about the, um, uh, because you, you mentioned the Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova, and I'm just thinking that we, we are so, uh, I mean, historically, we are so different, because uh, in Ukraine, we're always talking about that we are uh, backing, not fortunately to USSR, but to the European house, because in times of Kivska Rus, Ukraine was one of the leading countries of Europe. So that is why the European values and uh, European um, um, principles, uh, it's, uh, they are very close to us. So it's not uh, something, uh, something foreign uh, for Ukrainians. But from the perspective of international scholar, maybe, maybe um, it's uh, we should we should explain some uh, some things. Okay, uh, and uh, dear audience, dear participants, thank you very much for your engagement, for your participation, for your brilliant presentation. Uh, thanks again, um, dear um, uh, members, um, speakers, for your brilliant, excellent uh, speeches. And I'm um, I'm very happy to open the discussion. So please, um, if you have any questions, please raise your hand uh, and feel free to ask any any questions. Yeah. So we have questions from uh, from um, uh, from our university from here. So uh, I think that you yeah you should you should come because uh, in order to. Uh, to hear your questions for our online uh, audience. So. Yes, hello. Uh, I'm Shunsaf Tatik from the Aguilan University of Krakow. And actually, I have a question to, to another person in the room. So that's uh, uh, a little bit funny. I, I've got a question to, to Professor Pukop. Uh, thank you very much for, for your uh, splendid presentation. Um, I, I believe that, of course, uh, a number of processes that you have referred to uh, have been shared in other European countries, there is some kind of legacy of, I would say, over positivization of interpretation of law that um, we had uh, after the socialist period. And of course, from, from there on, we had some, some methods to, uh, to, to enter into some kind of more flexible area of, of interpreting the law. But uh, I will have a question about um, the training of the future judges in, in Ukraine. Uh, and uh, how this process looks like uh, right now, because of course it's absolutely crucial for for, uh, for the future of the judiciary if we want to uh, to make the judiciary more flexible and more apt to um, uh, to use principles, some, some kind of more sophisticated argumentation and and ways of interpreting the law, to to precisely offer the uh, the judicial trainees some methods of of interpretation. So as uh, I'm wondering how that looks, and of course, to which extent has it been disrupted by the uh, by the ongoing war, and and what's your take on this precisely the selection of of new uh, new members of of the judiciary for uh, for Ukraine? Thank you. Thank you for this brilliant question, and it is already the second time. Uh, that I'm called professor, the third, the third I, I'm not, but the third time I hear that from the member of uh, the scholar community of the Jagiellonian University. I will treat that as uh, an intention to award me an ordinary degree from this university. But um, in all seriousness, answering that brilliant question, uh, let me share with you the experience of participating in many trainings. And I must say that actually the adoption of new knowledge, the reception of it and application of new doctrines uh, in the practical work while uh, deciding upon, upon the case and forming the case law are quite different processes. Actually, I, I believe that you might understand that there were many trainings, there were, there were many professionals that were involved in the process of uh, uh, persuading the judges to 
uh, decide with the rule of law in mind uh, to decide based on high uh, principles fun, uh, in taking into account the fundamental rights. But it, it is a long way from knowing the doctrine, the principle, and applying it in your decision. So I believe it's only recently, only several years ago that uh, the judiciary was renewed in a way that the people who actually believe in those principles, who have the stamina to say to the colleagues, let's take it seriously and let's apply them and uh, not just discuss them during the, the uh, meetings with, with colleagues and with scholars. So um, I believe that, uh, yes, we need more and more of those trainings. We need more and more of sharing the experience. Uh, th this is actually part of the um, self-reflection and self-control. When I'm here and I need to present you some results, I kind of feel accountable for uh, explaining you um, without any uh, false trying to persuade you that the situation in Ukrainian judiciary in, par in particular is very optimistic and is absolutely fine. No, uh, I need to present you and my um, fellow colleagues in, in Ukraine with actual results with something that might be analyzed by the rational mind and the rational mind can come to the same conclusions. But again, as I see, the, um, we have much uh, in, in common with, uh, um, with Poland. And I believe that we need to strengthen the cooperation with uh, um, scholars in Poland, with the Polish members of Polish judiciary so that the countries with uh, comparable judicial system, with comparable workload and comparable uh, size and population really can, can share the valuable experience. So essentially what I'm talking about that certainly, certainly we need uh, more of that. We need more uh, involvement of our colleagues from the countries that are already part of the European Union to help us go to, through uh, those pro processes that we established before ourselves. Uh, that, that is why I called uh, my presentation as more optimistic if compared to the presentation of Professor Shevchuk, because in these um, dark times of war, Ukraine uh, reaffirmed and reaffirmed uh, the European aspirations and uh, took this enormous burden of enter the European Communion of uh, community of uh, uh, countries that are sharing the European uh, values, not as a weak countries country that is weakened by the war and that is restricting some fundamental liberties in as little as possible. But also we are trying to prepare the um, accession of Ukraine to, to, to the European Union. This is an enormous task. So certainly we have the problem of uh, that regula uh, regulation and uh, uh, administration of justice in the wartime but we are preparing ourselves for something that might be that in, in the nearest future. We uh, do not, we are not focused on just the wartime. In the wartime, we also are preparing for what comes next. And uh, I hope that I answered the question. And since this is a kind of hot potato, I'm here already. Uh, I take the liberty to, uh, a little abuse this power and to ask my question to Professor uh, Di uh, uh, Gregorio 
uh, you emphasize separate trends of development of the constitutionalism among post-Soviet uh, nations. However, uh, like Baltic Republic is one group, uh, Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, and Armenia in your presentation uh, are following a rather um, different path. Other republics are showing authoritarian, authorita authoritarian tendencies. So my question is, uh, does the term post-Soviet countries obtain the more geographical or rather uh, historical meaning? Or is there still a tendency, leading tendency that is common to all of those countries? So in your view, it's kind of follow up uh, of the question that uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Kristina Trichlip already answered, uh, uh, already asked, but uh, please uh, provide us with your insight. Is there a still um, a thing, post-Soviet countries as something that is governed or led by some powerful common tendencies or which is, uh, more optimistic, or are we going separate path, paths? I hope that Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, and Armenia are going towards Europe and democratization and their rule of law. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to ask this question. May May I uh, answer? Uh, you're welcome. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I know these terms, uh, post-Soviet, uh, the term post-Soviet is not uh, maybe a good one, uh, but it is used in international uh, constitutional law literature, including Italy, but also in other countries, um, because it's difficult to find another one uh, common term. Uh, unless we use the, um, um, we, we make a difference between uh, uh, countries that are already in the Union, such as, for example, the Baltic states, uh, countries that are candidates uh, to enter the Union, such as now uh, only Ukraine and Moldova, because Georgia has not, uh, has not yet the official status, and uh, countries that are not even uh, uh, close to the union in, in, in any kind of uh, relations. Uh, in the past, we used the term uh, countries uh, included in the Eastern uh, Partnership uh, policy of the European Union. So it is difficult to, to, um, to find a, 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 a term that will, um, satisfy all the requirements in the classification. Uh, but I think that obviously that Ukraine is moving towards the European Union uh, values and uh, uh, requirements very, very fast. Uh, also before the war, because um, I know that Ukraine was among the three countries that signed the association agreement, uh, again, Moldova, uh, Georgia and um, uh, Ukraine, the first one to implement, to adopt in the uh, in the legal in its legal order the acquis communautaire. So it uh, already had uh, went further than the others two. Uh, but uh, as far as the European Union values and the acceptance of the European Union values, we have to be aware because as I said in my presentation, there is also inside the European Union uh, a populist or a sovereignist or a, a illiberal constitutionalism, a, a trend which, uh, as you know, include Hungary and Poland for some tips also, Romanian and other, uh, other countries. So um, it, it's tough. Uh, it, it's difficult to, to find a classification uh, in this moment. The situation is moving, is moving fast. And I, I hope that we will, we will now uh, again to comment uh, a new uh, 
constitutional amendment, uh, a new constitution, maybe after the end of the war. But I, I, I don't know if I, I answered your, um, your, your question. Maybe um, uh, let me know if I, I can add something, something else. So oh, dear justice, I satisfied with this answer. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, and we have the question from online audience, uh, Natalia Blazinska. Uh, please, you're welcome. Uh, thank you, Pani Monica. Uh, dear speakers, dear organizers, I uh, want to say uh, thank you for organizing such a great event. I am uh, also judge from uh, Ukraine Supreme Court, but I'm an administrative uh, judge and. Uh, I just want to clarify uh, to what my colleague said concerning the principles. Of course, we were applying principles and doctrines, at least in administrative jurisdiction prior to uh, 2017. And what, uh, what I agree totally that uh, uh, together oh, we are stronger. I mean, when we have dialogue with uh, uh, lawyers, with uh, scholars, with judges from uh, other countries. We can compare at what level we are now, where should we go? And it is very important to stress that we have such a great cooperation with Nevis Sond Administracyjny, it's a Supreme Administrative Court uh, of Poland. And uh, among the European Association of Administrative Judges, we cooperate on different uh, topics uh, and I have to say that uh, concerning a key communique, for example our custom spot uh, or our tax code it's already in line with the key communique because um, our parliament already amended and it is very easy for me for example to check if my practice is uh, the same as in Austria, in Poland, in Germany, in applying this or that legal norm, because legal norms are the same. For example, in Poland, we have uh, in dubio pro tributario in tax cases. In Ukraine, we have the same application. So it is very important to have dialogue. I agree totally with all the speakers. The dialogue is the most important, and it is very important to have uh, uh, the law, um, every law should be like the same uh, concerning a key community in all the uh, uh, spheres. Uh, and having this, we can compare are we in line or not, because other things are very theoretical. Only when we see application in practice, we can uh, say our like uh, mm, opinion if we are in line or not this is very important and i want to say to you a few words that nevertheless that we were even without electricity all this uh, all the winter we were working not only as like in our ordinary work as judges we were still having communication with our colleagues from all over the world and this support is so important that I even can't tell you how important it is. Sometimes it was like this, that after missiles and everything, we were like all nervous, but then we know that in an hour we have a meeting with our colleagues and it was like a blessing for us because for this time uh, of meeting, we were not like thinking about the reality, we were thinking about our future. And I will finish with that, that uh, we are looking for our uh, future uh, in European Union and we are working, trying to work very hard and uh, as a tax judge, because in administrative court I am specialized in tax cases, I will say that even now in Ukraine we are uh, having permission and translating OECD commentaries. Uh, actually, as for now, OECD commentaries are only in English and French. And Ukraine will be the first country uh, which received this permission. So uh, it will be like a real blessing for our tax judges because uh, they will there will be no need to translate commentaries and in tax cases in in transfer pricing cases. It's very important because like uh, OECD principles are applied all over the world. So we are looking forward to celebrate victory and to be in uh, our European family. And thank you so much for this great event and for great speeches. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you very much. And we have questions from uh, Alice. Alice, you're welcome. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, actually, my question follows on very directly from Natalia's comments. It was a question to uh, Justice, soon to be Professor Filkov, um, which was um, very specific about whether Ukrainian judges have managed to participate in the European Court of Human Rights Superior Courts Network, which I think aimed to provide a kind of structured way of engaging in exactly the sort of dialogue that Natalia was just talking about. Um, just to be interesting to know if, if how, how active, uh, if at all, that membership of the Superior Courts Network is. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Uh, yeah, and um, dear Justice Sipilko wants to comment. I thought that was a question, so certainly but the judges in Ukraine are uh, actively participating in uh, uh, different networks and organizations that are uh, working with uh, the judiciary, with the administration of justice. It's the um, organization that are uh, aimed at uh, promoting the efficiency of the judiciary, uh, the um, organization that joins the heads of the Supreme Courts of, the, uh, of, of Europe. Uh, personally, I am not a member of uh, any of those uh, organizations uh, and I'm not the representative of the Ukrainian Supreme Court as an institution there so for me it's kind of hard to uh, provide you with with any detailed information on the participation but uh, of course Ukraine is uh, it takes part in the uh, in those organizations and in those where the uh, membership is limited to the uh, judiciary of the member states. I believe that Ukraine uh, has the status of the mm, corresponding member or, or something like that, that allows us to obtain, obtain information and communicate and also obtain the assistance from the uh, Supreme Court Supreme Courts of other member states. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe Professor Stanislav Shachuk wants to comment something because she was the the chairman of the Constitution. I mean, in the context of the relation between Constitution. Yeah, Professor. Yeah. Sorry, Christina. Which kind of cooperation? Uh, I mean, between constitutional courts. Uh, yes, but now this, this is um, some kind of several events, you know, several events around the constitutional court because the constitutional court judges and uh, on the edge of the quorum because now uh, all these 18 judges uh, out of 18 according to the constitution and places and for the position you know uh, that uh, there are several opinions of the venice commission about the procedure of nomination of judges because it's a very important situation we had in the crisis in 2020 uh, we, when the head of the constitutional court was mr tupitsky and now um, the problem is that uh, the chamber doesn't work properly, only uh, senates on the constitutional complaints, because uh, the great chamber it's, uh, decides issues on uh, general constitutional application, constitutional submission of the people deputies on abstract constitutional control. But senates, it's divided from two senates in Ukraine, it's a uh, uh, the jurisdiction on the constitutional complaints directly and the especially second uh, senate very active on this kind but uh, 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 great chambers not so effective in this year only one decision that last year two or three and uh, this is a problem because now is this kind of blocking not the blocking but we are expecting that new judges will come according to the new rules of nomination by the competition by uh, because the quota three judges from parliament and two from the middle uh, judiciary and uh, now this is we actually we're expecting that the law in the parliament uh, will be adopted finally 
uh, according to the recommendation of Venice Commission, now this is uh, discussion about uh, who will be the casting vote because in the previous uh, uh, previous uh, opinions of the Venice Commission, uh, that uh, the idea was that if we, if Ukraine refuse to define who uh, who will be the uh, final solution if the uh, decisions uh, if there's no, no possibility to decision because the balance between uh, uh, no priority in the vote uh, they uh, the venice commission told her in the opinion that uh, in this case please uh, we pro we propose uh, that uh, seven members of the um, uh, selection committee. Uh, in the majority of them are uh, this uh, members who would be nominated by the international organizations. Uh, Ukraine says that it's okay, no, but not it's uh, against our sovereignty as usual. This is post-constitutionalism, as Angela said, because it's, we, it's our sovereignty to nominate judges. And uh, now this is last the opinion of the Venice Commission. It's uh, 50 to 50 with the casting vote of foreign participants of this commission. Mm -hmm. Now we are waiting uh, to start this process of selection of judges because really this is a problem, real problem for the proper functioning of the Constitutional Court of Ukraine. And also some words about the very important changes uh, in November, February uh, 2018, when uh, this is so-called geopolitical orientation uh, clause of the, our constitution, when the, uh, when the parliament finally inter introduced uh, changes to the constitution, to the preamble for what the constitution and to the powers of the president, cabinet of ministers and the uh, uh, parliament. Uh, that the uh, confirming the European identity of, Euro of European uh, Ukrainian people and uh, uh, straight forward moving to the European and Europe, Euro Atlantic Atlantic course of Ukraine to so this is to the membership to yes EU and NATO. And this was very important, especially before the beginning of the war. It means uh, that uh, no uh, legal act and law of Ukraine. Uh, it's impossible to pass this law, which is uh, returned this moving to the in the opposite way. And uh, I, as a judge, at that time uh, of the Constitutional Court, we started the idea 2015 together with our uh, uh, colleagues and friends, uh, uh, with the head of the president of the Lithuanian Constitutional Court, Mr. Jalimas, with the Georgian Constitutional Court, uh, George Papiashvili. We supported this idea, Alexander Tanase from Moldova, we organized even the special BBCJ, it's, it's a Baltic States uh, Balt uh, Association of CIS for, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for the constitutional courts uh, together towards the European movement of, of us. But uh, particularly we, uh, we pushed this idea and in the last term, uh, last, uh, last uh, month uh, in office of Mr. Poroshenko, previous president, they put it forward as official introduction of these changes. He, uh, and I was uh, chairman of the court in November 22nd, 2018, we voted for the positive opinion because according to the, on these changes, because uh, it's uh, according to our constitution, uh, the, the constitutional court must produce uh, 100 positive opinion to be uh, voted in the parliament for the, into, for the changes to the constitution. It was a real detective story. Uh, how uh, I was under pressure from various uh, conservative political forces, how we uh, how we voted for this opinion. But uh, for me uh, and my colleagues, we are really proud that we started this uh, uh, absolutely new, completed new development for our Ukrainian constitutionalism. And now we are fighting with this enemy, especially for our European identity, because we are also Europeans as uh, our colleagues were participating in our great seminar, uh, international seminar. <clears throat> Thank you very much for a um, very valuable uh, contribution. Um, I just uh, want to uh, give um, the the word to Professor Marta Senevitska, and if uh, after uh, her word, if you have any questions or comments, we will continue. But Marta, just uh, um, want to uh, to um, to reflect. Um, 
uh, on our seminar. So um, I would like to um, invite Professor Marta Senevitska. She is Associate Professor at the Department of the Philosophy of Law and Legal Ethics uh, at the Faculty of Law and Administration of Vigilon University. And also she is a member of our research group. So Marta, you're welcome. Uh, hello, everybody. Yes, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I have to leave uh, in a few minutes. That's why um, uh, I would like to say a few words, actually not about the seminar, but I'm very thankful to all the uh, very interesting talks. Uh, I've learned a lot, uh, but I wanted to say a few words about our research group, um, which is supervised by Professor Monica florchak and I am a, I'm privileged to be a part of the group. Uh, so our research group is a part of a bigger project, which is called uh, Future Democracy Lab, and it was established at our university and funded by the so-called um, Excellence Initiative um, at the Jagiellonian University. Uh, and our uh, small working group um, uh, has the project which is entitled um, The Rule of Law and the Future of European Democracy. Uh, and we are interested in uh, analyzing the philosophical foundations of the um, and the doctrinal justification of the principle of the rule of law. I'm specialized in the philosophy of law, so um, I'm interested in these ideas. Uh, we are also interested in, um, uh, in analyzing uh, the normative framework um, of the rule of law and its uh, judicial uh, understanding, and, and also exploring the impact of the political and socioeconomic systems on the principle uh, of the rule of law. Uh, and also, we are very much interested um, in um, the crisis of the rule of law, as well as uh, the rule of law in the times of crisis, like the, the war. Uh, so this uh, seminar was related to one of our objectives of our project, um, connected to these uh, issues of um, um, emergency uh, situations, and, um, and definitely war. The war uh, is uh, one of these emergency situations in which, uh, to which we have to, uh, which require extra extraordinary responses. So on one hand, uh, the emergency uh, measures uh, are established to, um, uh, to, um, to preserve the rule of law in the, time of, uh, in the times of crisis, but on the other hand, they can be easily um, abused and actually there is a threat of the um, erosion of the rule of law in the times um, of crisis. So the crucial question is how to use uh, legal institutions in building a system which is resilient um, to any potential crisis and able to guarantee the protection of rights and freedoms uh, in uh, such situations and how to respond to the crisis with legal uh, measures and how to use the law to rebuild peace and, and address the damages and harm done during uh, the emergency situations such as war. Uh, so our research group um, is aimed at um, uh, organizing seminars like this one, which was organized by Christina, but also producing papers. And we are also interested in um, applying for um, for um, uh, for uh, within the uh, European um, um, framework research framework and the Horizon Europe for a, uh, for a grant. And the one which we are interested in is entitled the interrelation between social, cultural, and political identities, as well as the sense of belonging and democracies. So uh, um, um, that's why we decided to organize a set of seminars to get inspired uh, and to prepare the research uh, projects uh, um, um, in response to the, to the call, which I just mentioned. So the second seminar, which we will organize, uh, uh, will be held in uh, uh, September. Uh, and we, I hope that uh, at least some of you will be able to participate in that uh, seminar. It will be also held uh, in a hybrid version. So some participants will, participant, uh, will participate in person, uh, but um, um, also uh, we will have some contributions online. So we will keep you posted. And the second seminar, which we are organizing, uh, will... Uh, uh, we will address the issues related to the uh, to the European uh, uh, call. Uh, so we will uh, address the issues of uh, uh, of European values, uh, uh, democracy, and the sense of belonging. And we will keep you posted about these um, coming events. So once again, thank you very much for your great talks and for participating in this seminar. And I hope we'll stay in, in touch and continue our 
cooperation. Thank you very much. Thank you for such generous promotion of our research project. And um, so, uh, dear participants, uh, dear um, speakers, thanks a lot for your engagement, for your generous contribution to today's seminar. I realize that we have been talking almost three hours. So, um, but anyway, if you have any final questions, thoughts, comments, questions, please feel free to to come and to reflect. No? Yeah, yeah, you want? Yeah, so, okay. We have one from, from our um, uh, present our audience. So please present. Hello, I'm Maria Szczerbowska, Jagiellonia University, and thank you for all the presentations. They were really insightful. And I especially wanted to say thank you to Dr. Donald, uh, because like all those tremendous numbers she showed us, they were quite shocking for me. I, I'm, I'm quite aware of the problem of stagnancy uh, inside of the juridical world. Uh, and I obviously had to ask that question that perhaps breaks the scheme for the whole uh, for the whole event but i wanted to ask her uh, to ask you dr donald whether there was any thought of using artificial intelligence to help around those mundane tasks of solving similar uh, similar cases similar problems within the courts and i would be really thankful for any information on that if you have such Yeah, that's the point. For your engagement. So, uh, dear audience, dear participants, uh, any other comments, reflections? I'm very uh, happy to, to be here with you. So thank you very much again. And uh, see you, see you uh, on our next uh, events. See you and have a nice day. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you.